and we're live. It is Saturday, May 9th, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. We have some weird celebrity news with respect to our uh, two key foreign leaders. Uh, an actress who uh, was in the Harry Potter movies says she wanted Boris Johnson to die of coronavirus. Meanwhile, uh, which actress? Dennis, then? Just like one random one. Uh, her name is uh, Miriam Margoyles, and she is now a lady, uh, a, a Labour Party activist. Ah. Uh, and she has announced publicly that she was wishing death on Boris Johnson. Seems in good taste. Meanwhile, the New York Post, which is ever on the search for the weird angles on the Kim Jong Un death watch story reports that Dennis Rodman, famed Kim Jong-un watcher, thinks Kim Jong-un is alive, which we kind of know, and watching The Last Dance. I'm not sure why he thinks that he's watching The Last Dance. Meanwhile, we have big murder hornet news, which is that the New York Times' awesome podcast, The Daily, did an entire episode on murder hornets and it is awesome and pretty scary and uh, pretty cool. So if you're into murder hornets, and you should be because they're kind of badass, um, uh, check out the dailies. It was either Thursday or Friday, uh, and uh, it'll make you uh, quake in your shoes. Um, we're not allowed to have fun anymore. And in lieu of fun, we don't have anybody today except ourselves. Kate, it's good to see you. It's great to see you. I'm we, like, it is. it was snowing here this morning, Ben. Yeah, it was cold even here. It was, yeah, not snowing cold, I promise you. Um, That's true. But I did notice that Maggie Feldman Pilch uh, tweeted a picture of herself and Eric, her significant others, bundled up like it was the middle of winter walking outside with the uh, uh, caption, it's May, which I thought sort of summed it up. Yes, Maggie is in the tweet saying that it's in the in the chat saying that it's cold. I agree. Um, yeah, no, I think that it was freezing here. I had to cover all my plants. I haven't seen I haven't seen Rose, my favorite little bird for two days. I'm getting worried. Oh, That's this is, much... the, is the 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 woodpecker that you've been. No, eating. it's the rose-breasted grosbeak. Obviously. Oh, sorry. Anyway, um, and then I um, let's see what else. And then um, I um, it was okay. It's um, so I want to hear what you have to say about this. Okay, so earlier today. I was having um, a dialogue with like two or three people at the same time, as you do these days on the internet, uh, on on tweets, and um, there is, uh, and I sent a. I was discussing the fact that one of the uh, FCC commissioners had said, um, had basically said that um, a bunch of stuff about the oversight board and like maligning it and all of this other thing about how it wasn't going to be in support of free speech. And I was like, oh, we should ask him to come on when the, when the, uh, what should we, oh, when Jamal is on, on, and some other people on Monday. And so I kind of like, while I was typing with other people, I typed, uh, a Twitter, and I was also talking to other people about the FBI, FBI, FCC chairman at the same time, um, who was not the person who said this thing. Um, and his name is um, Ajit Pai, and he had not said this thing. And so like, I said, oh, you had a lot of thoughts on the board, come on the show. And he goes, I, he replied, and he said, I did. And then I immediately was like, I was like, oh crap. I like, I just was like, my totally like messed up. And I immediately replied and was like, no, you didn't. I'm very sorry. Like, and- um, I'll come on the show anyway. But I come on the show anyways. And I was like, it was, I was like, I like, like all, I, I made a joke out of it. It was like, hashtag all FCC leadership looks the same or like is the same or like something like that. And then I was just kind of like, um, 
And I was like, you're right, it was Brent, Brandon Carr, um, but come on the show anyways, we'd love to have you, blah, blah. He replies a few hours later with this hilarious picture of him um, with a giant, giant mug that has Reese's on it for some reason. And all of his, apparently all of the commissioners have these mugs because there's pictures of all of them with these mugs. And he's like, uh, it, like we do, I think, what did he say? It was like, we do look, uh, I do see the resemblance among my colleagues. Super funny. I thought it was hilarious reply, right? I write back, this is a great reply. I'm very, very funny. Now I'm not gonna name her name. A woman in, the, in, my, in response to this, who is apparently a tech policy person, is just like, this per, like his family has been horribly, like you wrote like your tweet was factually incorrect. And like, I do not think that your correction reply was adequate. People are going to think that he said these things about the oversight board, issue a correction, you delete your tweet. And I was like, no, I don't delete tweets. And like, he hasn't asked me to delete a tweet. No one's coming after him. There's like nothing. It's like kind of erroneous, but it wasn't even like it was wrong. Like it was, he wasn't, he didn't express thoughts on the oversight board, but it like got cleared up in like three, three, three things in the thread. And she just is like continuing to come at me right and now. And why are you being so delicate about not mentioning her name? She's attacking you in public. We can all go look up on Twitter who she is. Um, you, what, what, why, why the delicate? I don't know. I don't, I don't play that way. I don't play that way with people. Like I do. I know, but like, <laughs> anyways, so she just keeps, she's like, I think you should delete the tweet. Um, your correction of the threat is not enough. You have thousands of followers who just assume that what you said in your original tweet is true. You claim the chairman extensively commented on the oversight board when he didn't. On top of that, then it was implied that, oh, well, Brendan Carr, Ajit Pai, same thing. That was like, not what I said. Because what a chairman bends the commissioners to his will, if you don't delete the tweets, then issue a correction. I don't agree with commissioner's card opinion on the board. This has nothing to do with the chairman. I've seen very few people be co constantly harassed online and in real life as Ajit Pai has been for years. He is a good sport. So please clarify your tweet to 13,000 followers that you have. Uh, and I and I have like, I replied and I said like, I think that I, I said very kind of like matter of factly, like I don't delete my tweets. Audrey Pye seems fine with this. He's replied hilariously. Like, I think that this is like a complete, like, I think that this is fine. No one's requesting this besides you. And uh, then I said, you know, and I was like, I just kind of have like let it go. And then I said in, I tweeted out from Lou of Fun, um, the new Zoom link. And I uh, invited her to come on the show. And then she was like, seriously, instead of directly addressing your mistake, you're inviting me to what it, to a debate, why is why is erroneous in quotes? It was completely incorrect. Um, I mean, she's just like, I mean, she's not. Her, but I think is kind of interesting about this. Okay, it's just like, okay, is like she's she's coming at me with this thing. She's got this issue. I kind of invited to think she's not happy with how I'm like how I'm dealing with this. She wants me to just do what she says, right? Um, I'm not, she's not wrong. Like the thing was mostly like was erroneous, but it also was like not erroneous with like harm. There was no like, you know, there was no real harm and every, like I believe for the amount of harm that the I, tweet already I wanna, that. I want to suggest that the concept of standing has some relevance here. Right, it's like, why, like, is, she, person, why is she arguing for the, this? For those of you who don't uh, know the law of standing, the basic foundational principle is that you actually have to be the one who suffered an injury to have standing to raise the issue. So Kate's egregious mistake about Ajit Pai, uh, uh, who by Which the Which was way, like not even like, I, ugh, it wasn't like, no. a, it was just, it was just like a brain fart. It was like, it's Yo, not girl. like, this is like my life. <laughs> Ajit Pai oh. raised it in his own Yay, way. I'm glad she's here. And Kate Good. addressed it in her own way. Um, and, Oh, uh, we have. Um, She's here. Ashton I'm really Kazan. glad. So let's bring her in, uh, and I will lecture her about why she has no standing. Okay, go. Don't. Shit. We do not need to be okay. rude. We are civil here on In Lieu of Fun. We are. Hi. Hi. Welcome. So um, I have just been briefed on on your dispute um, about 
Um, so first of all, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you care. Well, I'm director of civil liberties at Tech Freedom, a think tank that uh, works in tech policy. I personally don't work on telecom policy. My personal views and my political opinions actually don't really align with you know, a lot of things that happen right now, uh, full disclosure. Uh, Kate might not remember me, but I was at Yale around the same time she you was. You look super familiar. I was actually yeah. just, yeah. You were the, you know, you were always the rock star at ISP lunches and I studied with Jack too. So I graduated in 2016. So I'm pretty sure we overlapped at some point. Yeah. Anyway, I care because I saw him and his family be harassed for years. And I just believe in the power of the internet mob, unfortunately. It has come after me a couple of times when I, you know, crossed the wrong person. I have nothing against Kate. I no, 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 no. So I, I also want to say, I didn't think that you had something. I just was like, there's a couple of things. It's like, I'm also against internet mobs, like, and right. I've written about it extensively. Okay, so like this is one of the things, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, actually, which is, this is actually kind of why I wanted you to come on was because I actually think it's a more interesting thing than just like correcting sure. a tweet or whatever, which is just that there's kind of this, I thought it was interesting because like, I just kind of don't, like he didn't ask me to. There's right. the tweets well, because not going Because he's a great viral. guy and he wouldn't. Um, I mean, I don't know him that well. Again, I don't work on telecom. Um, but from the couple of interactions that I had with him, like I don't agree with him on every a lot of things, but he's been always very nice. And I've seen personally him be harassed in conferences, online, for and, you know, him and to be clear, you might not agree with him, but unlike a lot of other government officials in this administration, he operates on his own values. Um, so yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I was like working on my PhD, cleaning my apartment. Um, <laughs> no, I was I not trying to. Like, can I ask you? Can I ask you a, an Ajit Pai harassment question? Because I was unaware that Ajit Pai has been uh, uh, broadly harassed. I know his uh, his policies are. People showed up to his kid's school. Uh, they were threats sent to his home. Yeah, this is actually she's completely correct. This is specifically during net neutrality, right? Yes. Yeah, I see. So we're it was, I was actually, um, so I do outreach for Tech Freedom. So I was at the FCC doing that hearing, the open hearing, and someone called in a bomb threat. And I just remember how scary it was for me. And I just imagine that happening on a daily basis. I see. So your, so, so your concern was not in a vacuum. It was that Kate had inadvertently made an error about him right. in the context And Kate, I of, mean, uh, Kate is just so well known, um, I you know, in not the really that policy well known. circles. Um, I don't know. I just was worried. She has a big following. If there's no clarification, I've said things that were not correct, both on internet and online and, you know, in real life. If you just don't say, hey, guys, like, I mixed this up. Um, people then like, there are a lot of people who are not rational and they go after, um, I don't know if you guys saw yesterday, I don't even know her. There's like this chef that apparently said comments about Chrissy Teigen and Mary Kondo. And then thousands and millions of people went after her because Chrissy Teigen retweeted it to like millions of followers. That and would be I'm, my not, yeah. I'm not even <laughs> sure what that That's is about. Everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I was literally like cleaning my apartment and trying to finish my PhD because my father said that if I don't do it in the quarantine, I will never do it. Um, <laughs> so well, you might never do it. as speaking. I just, yeah. I totally, I didn't mean to drag you into anything except that I thought that it kind of brought up an interesting question. One that like, he wasn't like, I didn't, I see, I completely agree with your point. I agree with it being wrong. I thought that I like, I thought that the thread pretty much did establish that, yeah. but I no, see I, no, totally. But like, my thing is not a lot of people look at the threat before they attack. That's it. I don't also think like, I don't think this was such a huge deal. Um, I didn't know you don't delete tweets. I also, when I saw commissioner Carr's thread on the board members, you know, I didn't agree with it fully either. Um, I've actually had Commissioner Carr on a 
on the Tech Policy Podcast. Um, he was again, very nice to me. Um, I'm originally from Russia. I grew up there. I went to college there uh, before moving to States. And um, I guess I didn't grow up in the dichotomy of you have to be Democrat or Republican. Um, I often disagree with people and then I still respect them and I try to understand where, where they come from. Um, so I haven't fully processed the board's announcements. I also want to see who the other 20 people are before making any, you know, conclusions. Um, I do work, sorry, for context, I work on Section 230 and free speech online. Um, you guys might have seen some of Tech Freedom's work, so that's yeah, what no, I I'm like for, super familiar with Tech Freedom and like, but I looked at your profile and like, I didn't, as soon as I saw your face, I like recognized you, but I didn't recognize your name, but yeah. Um, but no, so it's, it's I, Listen, I see your point and I'm actually kind of now I'm very, you've kind of changed my mind a little, frankly, of like, maybe it's worth doing it because I'm looking through like the stats on it and it has been retweeted. That one tweet has been retweeted. So which is like, and it is kind of like maybe getting separated from the rest of the thread. And that's a good point. My arguments, my, I would just, I would just say this. Can I suggest one, there's a very easy uh, solution to this problem, which is for you to apply, reply to your own tweet in a fashion that says, I've learned that this is an error, please disregard. And then you don't have to, de to delete it. And I'm, I don't delete my tweets either because it has a quality of erasing history and I don't really believe in doing that. But, uh, and I don't wanna not be accountable for things I've said, but you append a little thing on the, on the end of it so that anybody who sees it will also see the, uh, I'm sorry, this was untrue. And I, I'm not sure why that doesn't create clear, uh, doesn't uh, uh, address the problem completely. I do think the better solution would be for Ajit Pai to come on in lieu of fun and have a cool conversation about all these telecom issues that are legitimately controversial. And for which, by the way, nobody should be showing up at his kid's school. Yeah, I mean, I take your point. I think that, but I think Ashkin's, point and I think that's something we all have experienced in our various moments of being harassed online is that things get unmarried from the original tweet and that the idea like and I think this is I mean I think I have even though I was joking kind of made a joke out of like my you know the so I don't know if you saw Ashkin that I, like I did like I had this whole okay I was explaining how I accidentally added Ajapai when I meant to at car, which was like that I was having three conversations and one was about pie with somebody and one was about car. And I just like, oh, okay. Brain yeah, I'm sorry. Also, I like, you know, I've been in this studio apartment for eight weeks now. Like, um, every little thing now feels like the end of the world. Um, but yeah. I, I don't know. I'm what not would asking you. you. Well, if I can't delete it, would you? What would you, you think that like the solution would be like a like a retweet with like comment that like says something or just yeah, just like, like hey guys, I meant Brendan Carr. Okay, but I'm yeah, happy I'm to not, do that. Yeah, I I don't think I I have. I'm sorry. I don't think I have a place to tell you what to do. It just it just triggered me in that moment. I'm glad yeah. to meet you both. Hey, um, look, I just want to say. If people gave this kind of consideration, we've just given uh, uh, 20 minutes of consideration to how to handle a uh, minor error in a tweet. I think if everybody uh, was that scrupulous about uh, the truth of every individual tweet, the world would be uh, like a, a 30 times better place. So I think it's super cool that you raised the issue um, and, and uh, Kate, I think it's like cool that you're, you didn't just blow it off. And um, I think the uh, Lisa Page puppet may have something to say on this subject, Kate. No, wait, um, hold on, I have to get the Lisa Page puppet. Uh, I want to address, someone said that I am oi. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know. Um, but I, I enraged not, someone. It's not public. You irritated somebody. That's the nature of the show. Um, uh, don't yeah, welcome to real, like, wait, you, you should have seen what some of the Zoom bombers used to say at us. Holy yeah, shit. Can... <laughs> um, okay, Lisa Page Puppet. Um, yeah, I think that there's, 
Yeah. No, I don't know. We don't have anything. There's no Lisa Page puppet, Ben. Oh, there is. Oh. Yeah. There's the Lisa Page puppet definitely has something to say. Oh, okay. Check check your uh, uh your okay. check your your I message. Oh, she says, "Welcome to my world." Yes, that is what she says. Anyways, she is Lisa right. Page is, is has gone through a lot. We've been. Online harassment has been a huge part of this of this show. I'm super glad that you brought this up. Um, I hope that what I end up saying in reply will uh, do will make you feel like this is resolved. But yeah, it's also really nice to see you and great that you're working on at Tech Freedom. It's doing great work. Thank so. you. Good. It's nice to meet you guys. Good, to Good meet luck you with your up. PhD. Also, also be really nice to yourself because PhD writing sucks and quarantine sucks. And so, do not let anyone fool you that just because you're in quarantine. Yeah. I'm on year seven. It's now or never. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, be in Goodbye touch and thank you for coming on. Bye, guys. All right. Um, should we plan the show? Um, yeah. We have uh, we have a yeah, Monday and Tuesday to take care of. Yeah. So talk to us about Monday and then I'll talk about Tuesday. Um, Monday. Right now we have two. Um, oversight board members. I think that this is maybe gonna be kind of their first uh, televised appearance, if we count this as television, which I don't really know that we do. I but anyways, I think that this is their first kind of like live interview. Um, and one is um, that one of the chairs, Jamal Green, who's at Columbia Law School and uh, writes about freedom of expression among other things. And another is uh, a friend of my, a friend of mine, Nick Souser, who is, um, also uh, writes extensively about content moderation and platform governance. Um, and he's based in Australia. So he will be up in like, I don't know, at like five in the morning or something like that. To, That's to above and beyond the call of duty. I know, and he was like super amped to come on. I think it'll be really interesting. I'm trying to kind of get some other people. I was gonna have maybe like Nate personally drop by and say hello. He's he knows um, Jamal very well. They've done a lot of work on free expression and democracy together. Um, yeah, so you're gonna have to take the lead on that one because yeah, I've got it. I've got Monday, but I have nothing to do on that subject than I've ever known. So I know, and we'll stop talking about the oversight board eventually. It just like felt like a really cool opportunity, and Jamal Absolutely. watched the great show that we had. What was it Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday with Daphne. Keller and Nicole Wong and uh, Alex McElvray and um, and Evelyn Duick. And basically, um, I guess he watched it and like really liked it. And so he wanted to come on the show. So I was very flattered. I was, was like, oh, great. Super great. And of course we should do that. So okay. Tuesday, we have Tim Miller. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys uh, uh, that name means something to, but for those of you who uh, follow the never Trump conservative world. Tim is a um, sort of particularly interesting figure in this. He's a young, he was a young uh, political operative in the Republican party. He was, uh, actually I think he was Sean Spicer's deputy when, when Spicer was the uh, RNC spokesman. And he, you know, was one of these hard charging uh, conservative operatives and he um, just said no on Trump, and it has completely unended his upended his life, and he um, is uh, now living in Oakland. And of course, like all of the Never Trumpers who really put it all on the line, uh, Tim is now, of course, employed by uh, uh, Sarah Longwell and the Bulwark crowd where he has written an incredible set of essays uh, uh, that are uh, really searing about some of the people that he used to work with um, and about the choices that they've made. Um, and I think Tim is just a really interesting, thoughtful, and very funny, actually, guy. And he's um, got an amazing story. And I also, uh, I, you know, in a just deep way, sort of salute his struggle. And so I, um, I, we don't know each other well, but we've kind of tweeted at each other a fair bit over the years. And I, I 
uh, have met in person a couple of times, but um, I'm sort of really looking forward to having a protracted conversation with him. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm like excited for that. Um, yeah, um, I kind of think it's funny. It's been like, we've had like a few days now where like there's a guest where I feel like they're so in your wheelhouse. And then there's like a guest that is like, so in my wheelhouse. Um, but like, I would say that that's actually been overall, like kind of like not the trend for the show. I think that no, we've I had think like a nice not. mix. I think we've had a nice mix. And by the way, you know, our wheelhouses overlap, but there are, and they overlap in a very substantial way, but there is a set of people who are kind of more part of your world and there's a set of people that are more kind of my world and that's like if we didn't have that we might as well only have one of us right so like that's good yeah, um totally. that, oh and tomorrow of course we have a couple of mystery guests oh yeah i'm excited um, which is going to be fun um and uh um uh I'm not gonna say anything more about it than that, except um, you will want to join tomorrow for the mystery guests. Um, and that brings us to Wednesday. Who should we get for Wednesday and Thursday and for that matter, Friday? Um, Do we have a theme for Oh, I have a good idea. If you wanna, what? like in the object pie department, um, my, uh, Ajit Pai's predecessor as FCC chairman is a Brookings colleague of mine named Tom Wheeler, who is oh, yeah. uh, very smart, uh, very interesting, and very fun. And I suspect he would be game to uh, to, to to join us if if that's uh, of interest. If you're if you kind of want to talk uh, telecom policy, I don't know what you were tweeting about that was uh, of FCC interest, but if you want like FCC peeps. Yeah, it's like, yeah, no, it's not. I think that that's, um, that would be great. I think that that's fine. Uh, we don't have to do that this week either. Like if we want to take a break from kind of some things like kind of FCC or like, or oversight board or a little bit. Um, what do you think about, um, trying to think of like other people. I know I have like a, like a long list. We could try to get Ken White on. We've, he said yes and wants to do it, but he couldn't come that day. Yeah, so I, I I think Ken is super high substance. And I, you know, for those of you who don't listen to his podcast with Josh Barrow, All the President's Lawyers, uh, I think it's really great. And it's really informative and legally sophisticated. Uh, and actually, even more than legally sophisticated, it's litigation sophisticated, which is rarer. Um, so I would love to have Ken. He was on as part of one of our group mystery guests uh, episodes, but it was a little bit less him and a little bit more uh, of a group. So I would love to have him back. And actually, I'd love to have Crime a Day back as well on an individual basis if, if you're game for that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that sounds great. And there's like, um, yeah. I kind of would love to check in with Nate personally again about how election stuff is going. Yeah, uh, that's good. so Emily Bazelon just had a long, I think to out today, a long piece in the New York Times Magazine that about the sort of election meltdown scenarios that Nate uh, played a significant role in. And, and I think it'd be a great time to have him back. Yeah, or else have Emily on too. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, what about wildly out of the box stuff? I, 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 you know, just speaking personally to me, the greatest episode we've ever done is the one with live bees. And so I'm thinking about like, who can we have that will like do something as cool in real time as open up a bees hive and and uh you know kind of show us what's going on inside oh i definitely have like many people i think i could tap for that um i'm trying to think it won't be bees again but um let me think 
Um, I mean, no, no, like, you know, uh, Tiger King abuse scenarios, but, but I do think like, like there was something really coolly kinetic about that. And um, I, I really enjoyed that. Jeff is super, he's really great. We should also have him on a, to talk about being a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and other places and like things like that. But it was, but he's like, uh, he's super unique kind of in that way. Um, trying to think of like other friends that I have that are kind of like, I feel like I have a lot of friends that are crazy and esoteric like that, but. Um, I love the crazy esoteric shit. I think, I think, you know, like, I, I, you know, signed on expecting to have a conversation about content moderation and we got murder hornets and bees. And I think that like the show has no higher purpose than to, <laughs> to kind of bait and switch people like this. So we have a question from Catherine Maddox, who is a, who's been in, I've seen your name, Catherine, in the attendees list many times. This is the first time you've ever uh, 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 raised your hand to come on. What's on your mind? Hi, how are you? Good to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. I love your stuff. Um, I'm a fellow longtime journalist, currently doing some teaching work. Um, and it's just really great to watch you guys like sit and chat in front of the whole world. And I also follow your podcast. I love rational security. Lots of laughs. <laughs> Lots Thanks. of laughs. <laughs> Come to the live show on, on Wednesday. I signed up. I'm kind of shy, you know, as someone who was in radio, I was at NPR for a long time. I'm kind of shy <laughs> and I have a, I don't Let's like- Let's go together. <laughs> Can I, okay, I do actually want to ask Kate about this because I do think you both were very gracious, but can I just say that the description on rational security about the Venezuela caper reminded me, if you are a Woody Allen fan of the movie Bananas, <laughs> and, it made, and the Bay of Piglets. I actually texted my sister about it, who's also uh, a journalist up in New York. So thank you for that, because you guys do make me laugh a lot. You know, rational security, um, despite all of our jokes about scotch, is almost always done sober. And um, I, there is always this question about like how far can oh, you- Oh, no, 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 You guys are perfect. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously, I was a radio producer for a long time. So I'm really super critical. I'm a tough sell. You guys strike the exact right balance. And if people don't get it- Well, thank you so much. It. No, you it's, know, I, it's funny. I, I really, oh, sorry. We're getting some feedback now. Oh, um, oh, it's gone. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a look, it's a delicate balance because, um, you know, it's a high substance show and it's one that the four of us, you know, it started with three of us and then we kind of added Susan when she came to Brookings. Um, but it has been, you know, it's a show with a particularly intimate relationship with its listenership. Mm. So unlike the Lawfare podcast, which varies a lot episode by episode about how many people listen to it. Basically, as best as I can tell from the data, every rational security listener listens to every episode. Yeah. And, you know, it's this very devoted listenership that listens every week and they have a real rapport with the four of us and our sometimes, you know, one of us is not there and we'll bring in a guest or we'll do three. But there's a, there's a real kind of intimacy to it that is qualitatively different from anything else I have ever worked on that, you know, the and it number worked. of listeners. I have to tell you, it, the secret sauce of that show, if you don't mind me stepping on you. <laughs> no, go ahead. So I found it via Lawfare. So Lawfare, it's not even my beat. I haven't done that, but I just, you know, because of the moment we're in. So some of the deep dives are fantastic. And then there was some kind of sidebar comment made about rational security. And I was like, and I'm an audiophile. So I'll listen to almost, and I'll try a lot of stuff. I listen to stuff from the Trump people, everything. Cause I'm, I like to have a big menu. Anyhow, so I got to rational security and I thought this feels like I am sitting around at the horseshoe at All Things Considered when I worked there about a hundred years ago, 
and Robert Siegel has just walked out or Linda and they've said something really, really funny, but it's also on a really serious topic. You somehow mix the cerebral and really information-based with the sense that I'm having like cocktails with you. And that is, it works. Like I still think about Shane Harris saying, cool whip. And your reaction, <laughs> to, and your reaction to it, you was so not, I, I love it, but maybe I'm just a weirdo, uh, you know, niche oriented scribe here that loves that kind of stuff. I really look forward to it, which maybe says something about the moment we're in. No, so, so I don't think it's about the moment, honestly, because mm -hmm. The rational security, again, unlike the Lawfare podcast mm -hmm. listenership, which has, you know, been it, it's it's quite variable depending on the subject. Uh, the rational security listenership is smaller. Mm -hmm. um, it's about and it it grows steadily but slowly, but we never lose people, right? And so it's this very very committed. You know, it gets about 25,000 downloads a week. Mm -hmm. um, and it the variability is very slow. Whereas the Lawfare podcast, you know, gets around 40,000 downloads a week, but it'll shoot up to 120,000. It'll go down to 25,000, right? It bounces around a lot because people aren't yeah. as committed to listening to everyone. But I think the point that you just made, which is that, you know, rational security is like sitting around and having cocktails with with Shane and Tammy and and Susan and me. And it, it's very conversational. It's clearly for people who like each other a lot and spend a lot of time together, which we, we do and we do. Um, it's, and like, well, it's like a cocktail party with really smart people who are also able to laugh at themselves and also able to somehow smooth over this sense of like, I, I, again, <laughs> you know, is this, are we having to deal with these horrible situations again? You know, right. I will say the best law, because I think about these things, you're probably going to think I'm a freak guest, but. And just, I just want to point, I just want to point out that I did not put you up to this radical oh no 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 i i'm being i'm being a slightly obsequious but but i also being a radiophile and a producer and all the stuff i've done i i love to analyze this stuff and i think the lawfare i am so dedicated to it depending on the topic now i think the ones that i love the most on lawfare are when you got you assemble this amazing team of people like i've actually gone back and listened to a couple of them when, when I can't remember his name, you guys were going through all the Mueller stuff and all the permutations of all the, all that exhaustion. And I can't remember, it was a very high level national security someone whose name escapes me, I apologize. And he asked, um, he asked um, Susan Hennessy, he goes, okay, I'm gonna give you a grade on this. And you were sort of going through the, I think it was, um, at, oh, at the end, he was like, it's a B plus. Now, I think right. the kind of synergy that you guys pulled together when you were going through a lot of those, you'd have Jack Goldsmith, who I adore as well. Even if I don't agree, I just love the synergy. And when you, when you assemble all those people together, you know, it's, I find it really compelling. Maybe I'm a nerd, not all of them as much, but, but it depends. I do love those group ones though. I think they're fantastic. Look, I mean, you know, Somebody tweeted the other day, I forget who it was, that stat news is the new lawfare. And I read that with a combination of kind of relief, right? The, like, <laughs> yeah. This is a moment that like, okay, we don't have to be the center of this conversation. I've wondered if you're exhausted by it. I've wondered. No, it, it was completely exhausting. And yeah. it went on for three years. And, you know, everything that happened people were kind of looking to us for like, what's the, yeah. what do we have to say about this? And what's was, the hot take? What's um, the hot, deep I also, take? hot deep take? I, I also read it with a lot of pride, you know, that we, this was a moment that, you know, happened to not just implicate the expertise of the individuals that we had collected around us, but that our extended network was just exquisitely qualified to address in all kinds of ways. And Bob Lid is a is a great example of that. I mean, he's, you know, he was the general counsel of the DNI. He was, he ran the criminal division of the Justice Department. I mean, he's really been 
been around a lot of blocks a lot of times. By the way, he has a great piece in Lawfare today. Um, and, you know, he's, and for him to be having a sort of conversation, a highly substantive conversation with, you know, Susan Hennessy, in which, you know, he kind of jokingly says, I'll grade you on your answer. Um, <laughs> like, that's a very special moment where, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind you're... of fake patronizing, but actually it's a, oh, it's no, no, a no. sort of leveling of, totally of works. And you know, in this moment, you guys are able to connect, do that nuance is what I think is important. You really do bring nuance and it's gone out of style. I think that's why I like it so much. Well, you thank you so, so much for, for, for weighing in. It's, it's uh, like, like lovely to meet you and yeah. <laughs> lovely to, uh, and, and it's very, very gracious of you to, to say these very kind things. No, no, no worries. I, thank you for entertaining me. Now, Kate, sorry, <laughs> you have to move on. Just curious if you see my question. I thought you did just fine. And I, I think you guys were very gracious and I understand, I thought it was great she came on so you could see sort of her humanity, but it worries me, it, feel, it almost felt like a meta moment. And I just wonder since you of course- Meta was, how? Meta that it, it felt, okay, this comes from someone who's admittedly neurotic in this world, but it felt like, I, I felt like your response and his response, like you didn't need to, I was like, yeah, I get no, it. No, I didn't need to. I should just say like, I, I think that it would have been totally fine. Um, I didn't know that I had a, a passage of knowing Oshkin or of like course. whatever, but there was this, but I do think that like, and I take your point mm -hmm. and there's kind of was like, there's a little bit that like, I could have just like ignored it and not given it oxygen. Mm -hmm. But I actually did think that like she brought up, even though I disagreed with her, I think that she was using the same, I think she was coming motivationally from the same place as being against, um, or, or trying to be against like Absolutely. kind of harassment and per, and prevention of like kind of misinformation getting out there. And in that sense, I just like, I didn't think that I had really done something that rose to a circle high level for that, or that it was that important, but like, it felt that way to her. And I wanted to know why. And I just wanted to like, kind of yeah. hear it out. And like, I have the avenue of like, not of having this like forum. And I just wanted to, I thought she would be, and she was, she, once she articulated it, I kind of had a little bit more sense yeah. where things were kind of, where we were like not matching up. Um, but I'm kind of, I don't know. Anyways, don't worry too much. It wasn't like, oh, no. I really picked it out for a very specific reason. No, not at all. And I actually, I'll just say, I agree with you. I have that same curiosity. I always want to understand people. Like, I just don't understand where you're coming from. And so, you know, I agree with your, I think it, it's brave to do that. You handled it well. I just worry that sometimes we're in this moment where people, it's so easy to misunderstand, that's all. But, you know, props to you and thanks. Well, props to her for also coming on. I mean, Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, thank so, you for joining us. Thank you. And Chris, you have a question. Nice to see Hello. you. Also, so, like, somebody who has been lurking there in the attendees list for a long time. Well, so um, my question is for Kate, but to you, Ben, first, um, I first wanted to sign on to everything that Catherine said about rational security um, and everything you said, which is that I discovered it, I don't know, two years ago now, and I've listened to every episode since, um, whereas that's not the case with the Lawfare podcast. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, the data is super striking about this. Like, yeah, one, and I'm actually... One, um, one is a, a, a show that people listen to when they're interested in the subject. The other is something that people are really committed to. Yes, and I'm actually the recipient of a shout out from you a couple of years ago, because I sent you the um, album of Piazzolla, um, string music that I recommended oh, for you. Oh, that's so. awesome. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Rational Security opens with an Astor Piazzolla uh, riff and Chris, uh, uh, sorry, I did not recognize your name. Why would you? Uh, uh, alert me to uh, 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 Astor Piazzolla played on strings. So yes, uh, <laughs> you, are, you are a very welcome rational security listener. So my question for Kate was, so um, just to give people who don't know this background a little bit, um, on the 25th of April, she tweeted about the birthday of her article um, in the New Yorker last year about the Christchurch shooting and about Facebook's response to it and all, you know, stuff like that. And she included a quote from the article 
um, which was what likely disturbs us most about moments like Christchurch is that this kind of content exists and perhaps worse, that there are bad people trying uh, to make it spread. And she added a comment in her tweet saying um, that this was essentially reform reformulation of everything you hate about the internet is really everything you hate about humanity, um, which I think I mostly agree with, but it also got me to think about the idea that I might not totally agree with it because my question is for you about, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about, about this work. And so I'm curious if you've come across anything that addresses, how should I put it? The, the extent to which the internet's amplifying force, you know, the fact that it can rep reproduce images and ideas with such speed across, across such large distances, um, you know, the extent to which that has created any emergent properties in human society, you know, just like, you know, in biology and, you know, the extent to which the internet can't exist without human actors, obviously. And that's the essential truth of what you were saying. You know, humans are behind the things that happen on the internet, but they also respond to things that happen on the internet. And so I was wondering if there had been any sort of systematic psychological, sociological, et cetera, studies about what, what, what those things are that, that are created by these, what phenomena are created by I these. think, tell me if I'm understanding you correctly, like you kind of took my, you took my, what I said in my tweet and what I wrote in the article kind of about like the bad parts about the internet. Right. Um, and you're kind of wondering if like, are there good corollaries? No, I guess, I guess my, corollaries? I, I, no, I, I guess my question was like, to what extent is the internet really bad? Cause you were, your, you, your little formulation there, which, which was, I think was somewhat rhetorical is that everything you hate about the internet is just what you hate about people. And I guess my question is, what about the internet might really just be about the internet? Oh, that is, what 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 phenomena might occur in real life that 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 are not possible without the internet? You know, what people might be, you know, uh, and, and I don't have an answer for that. I was just curious if you had totally. encountered things so like this. This is a really okay. So I'm gonna so a few things, and you're very sweet to like have read the article and read that tweet. <laughs> I forget that people like really read the things that I write. I know that sounds stupid, but like I actually like I'm always surprised by it. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you read that? I barely read that and I wrote it. Like <laughs> if there's um anyways, uh the what do you say? It is the New Yorker. Oh, it was the New Yorker, yes. Um, but the um so the New Yorker. The uh this so this piece. I was specifically talking about like the arc of the piece was really specific. And so the, the right, arc of the right. piece was talking about really a, about like, okay, you have this mass murder and people live stream it. Mm -hmm. And then like, and then Facebook in the, in the, in the aftermath of that had really got born the brunt of kind of like, oh my God, what's wrong with Facebook? Why did they leave this up? They left it up to get clicks and blah, 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 blah. And this was just kind of, the, it, this was just like completely incorrect. And I, and I knew that because I knew a lot of people working in escalations, like very actively trying to take it down. And so I just thought that it would be interesting to kind of do a play by play. And once I started kind of digging into it, it was actually this horrible story of like, every time Facebook would find a way to get the video taken down, someone, some other mechanism in humanity would try to get it put back up, which was kind of why I, I said like, so what's the ugliest part about this is like right. that people are doing that and that's humanity and that's not the internet's fault. Like right. certainly the internet like kind of, kind of um, facilitates that and uh, the scale is greater, the amplification is greater, all of the things are greater, but that it's at, the, at core, it's just like people being assholes, right? right? Like, they're just like- Right, no, 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 like, and, and, and I'm not in any way disagreeing with that. I just then, it got me thinking about the, the extent to which there might be, like, it wasn't really about your article, my question. You know what I'm saying? I think that what, what you said in the article makes total sense in that case. Like, I don't think there was anything going on there. That, that is what I'm talking about. But I was just wondering if from your, you know, from your research about content moderation, about, you know, the way the internet affects societies, you knew of like specific, you know, studies or, you, you know, uh, what, what, whatever you would call them that, that, that do examine the phenomena that are specifically uh, enabled by the internet, you, you know, that, that, yes. that I mean, emergent well, properties. Here's, 
here's the internet. The internet is like, has, has gotten rid of what I would call like the meat. And like, this isn't just, I would, I call them the meat space affordances. Dana Boyd wrote about these very early on. Marianne Franks has written about these extensively and how they enable harassment. So has Daniel Citron. Um, but like what, like the basic understanding of what the internet does is it takes away all of kind of the, like the constraints that we have in day-to-day -day life. Like the fact, like shaming now is different than shaming then because it mm -hmm. takes, like it used to cost. NATO at somebody and like get you mad at them for doing something. Um, the uh, the current situation is obviously like it caught like and no one in like Tennessee would go her like shame someone in Washington State like that didn't make sense. Um, now there is just kind of this is like all of these uh, distinctions are not are not present. You can it's like basically like completely without cost. You can shame someone anonymously. You can, and I'm using shaming because it's just one example of exactly how the constraints have like, the internet has dis dissolved all of the constraints that used to kind of govern our behavior. And so now like you just, you know, you don't have to live in the same town as someone or know them. You can shame them online. You do it instantly. It's uh, it's everywhere. It's uh, it's you know it's amplified. It costs you nothing. You can do it anonymously, so your own reputation is on the line for shaming them. All of these types of things, and those are basically that. When we like when I teach internet law, when I, we study the internet, that is basically um, that is basically kind of what we discuss. So I use this example. I don't know if you've ever heard read. Um, if you haven't read it, it's such a beautiful piece. Um, David Foster Wallace's, um, uh, I think it was his commencement address to Kenyon College, and it was called uh, "What Is Water?" And it starts off with this uh, story about like there were two two fishies swimming in the sea, and they come upon like an old grandfather fish, and the old grandfather fish says to the says to them, "Hey boys, how's the water?" And then he swims on, and one fish looks to the other fish and goes, "What's water?" Mm -hmm. And I kind of like this example because I feel like what the internet does is like expose all of our laws that are based on the very fundamental physical world that we're used to living in and have relied on to enable our like our laws and constraints and they're which are now like like completely like not useful anymore in a lot of ways. Um, and so that's kind of, yeah, to your point, I think that like it's there's tons of studies on it. There's tons of stuff happening, but it, like that's I, I can't get into all of them. But that's the right, right. So theory. where would where would be a good place for me to look for you know sort of an overview of of these types of of investigations? About, I will post you know... something in lieu of fun for you if you check okay. on the on the Twitter and the Twitter stream if you want to look there. Will do. Yep. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So so uh, Kevin R, the mysterious Kevin R, has a uh, follow up to this. Um, yeah, so as, as you and Chris were talking, I was wondering, um, you know, to what extent is the problem with the internet the problem that it's concentrated people that, you know, in my daily life, not my COVID life, but my daily life, you know, I'm, you know, I walk by scores, maybe hundreds of people in a day. But that's my entire world. On the internet, it's millions of people who can interact, who you know can follow up on tweets and all that. And so, is it just a matter that you know, if there's if the world's one percent assholes, there's you know one asshole I might see on a typical day, but there's tens or hundreds of thousands of assholes I see on the internet. Well, as I like to say, Kevin, the squeaky asshole gets the grease. So <laughs> there's. I think that there's I mean, like a certain amount of knows you're a dog, but everybody knows you're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> but Kevin, you had great... what'd you just say? I just made that up. It's like, yeah, you should you should you should tweet that. I'm gonna uh, tweet. Um Kevin, right your now. point is a great one. It is another aspect of like the freedom from physical world that communicate that like the internet provides. Um, one of the most central, one of the most central, one of the most fundamental things the internet did 
in the early days and continues to do now was connect um, decentralized communities. And that in uh, like in the very early days, like that was a tremendous um, gift to a lot of people who lived in the margins of society, who lived in like, not like in kind of like secret or not, or like kind of um, not major, like trying to think, I'm basically thinking like gay culture, like various kink cultures, um, the, you know, young kids who had like, who didn't have any friends because like, that only played Dungeons and Dragons and didn't have any friends at their school could go online and find like a whole world of friends that also played Dungeons and Dragons and feel like they had community. Um, that's like, you're completely, um, you're completely correct. Um, but again, I think that you're also correct in saying that basically that there's a, like, there's a certain amount of like um, representation bias that we have towards like, I would call it like you, kind of say like, you know, of like 1% assholes, but uh, you know, you don't know how many assholes are lurking because they're not being like, they're not like, they're not doing anything so that you know that they're out there and exist, but they could be like really bad people. It's kind of about a definition. So like now you have the problem of like, okay, so is it 1% of the people who are assholes and talk a lot or suck, you know, or like troll people or harass people um, or whatever. So it's like a very specific type of like action plus intent, I would say. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think it actually kind of loops back into the discussion over prior days of what, you know, what do community standards look like? Because, you know, that that may be another part of the difference, which is, you know, there's the the communities may be different, and the way the ways to be an asshole in person are different from the ways to be an asshole on the internet, um, because you know, some somebody yelling at me on the street, you know, um, and you know, especially for women, people yelling at them on the street, that's a different level that may be a different sort of asshole than the than the people who you know well as it turns out it's like, on, but yeah, it's not, you had to not do that with your real face in your real yeah. body on the street you don't have to do that like with your real face and your real body like online it makes yeah. a huge difference in how i think that makes the biggest difference yeah. in the world i mean you know i i have a little hobby of kind of outing assholes on the internet and I am always amazed how sheepish they are once you identify them, like, you know, and like, that's a, like, I, I've been amazed by that from them. People send you from their own email accounts with their names on it, the most astonishingly abusive things. And then you just reply to them, would you talk to your sister like that? And they get really embarrassed. And you know, there's this perception that they are not actually talking to somebody. Um, that the moment you pierce it even a little bit, they actually retreat into some other mode of existence because they've just behaved in a way that they would never do without the mask of anonymity or even fake anonymity because they're not anonymous. But yeah. even if, yeah, I think that that's completely true. And, but Kevin, to your point, I think that there's, uh, you know, one, one last thing, which is that you said this might explain why the community standards are different. It entirely explains why the community standards have changed because the, the community did not used to be this global. Like you could, I mean, arguably you can't say that there is a global Facebook community. I mean, most people say that there's not, it's like a joke, like, but from 2004 to 2008, the community standard that governed all of Facebook when it was mostly inside the United States and most of the content moderators were mostly college age kids inside the United States was if it makes you feel bad, take it down, which is the equivalent of being in a small town that doesn't have speed limits and just has a don't drive too fast sign up. That is totally fine when everyone in the town can understand what don't drive too fast means. When you get into like this realm of like like what what makes you feel bad that's just there's just no uni unified global standard on that and that's why they had to start creating much more fine-grained much more like kind of um 
or particulate, I would almost say rules for what kind of speech could stay up or go down. And I mean, now you're talking about the thing that I think is the most fascinating thing in the world and just like an amazing moment of like anthropology and human history, so. Yeah, although I, I also wonder how much of that might just be something that gets solved with time because I mean, I've, I've been on the internet since Usenet days and mm -hmm. you know, it, it used to be that there, it seemed like there were regional variations within the US regional variations. You, you know, if you, if you were on, you know, a Southern California set of based boards, a geographic, you know, on Southern California topics, they'd be talking about it in different ways than Minnesota. I would say that they, those have changed have because left. of VPN. VPNs and because people are willing to self-identify, we used to be would self-identify with ge geographic bases, but they won't. Yeah. People don't do that anymore. Yeah, no, but, but what, what, are, the, what I was the, thinking is, it's kind of flattened. That it used to be there were state-to-state -state differences within the U.S. and at least online, that seems to be pretty flat. They're, the only thing that's left seems like the political difference now. Yeah, I would also just say though that the I, I agree with that, but I would also say that the um, we romanticize Usenet a lot, yeah. and and the you know the sort of self policing quality of Usenet. But the truth of the matter is that it was Usenet that gave rise to Godwin's law, right? Yeah. And it was it was pretty. We should have Mike Godwin on. Jesus, why haven't we had Mike on? Oh God. No, we can have Mike. We can call Mike Godwin. He would he would do it. He's uh. We can call him a Nazi. Like we can have every question. I feel so called. bad for this guy every time. Like there, he must not be able to do anything without like anything professionally without someone saying that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just too good a joke to not use. But, but Kevin, to your point, I do think that like you that like, yeah, there used to be state to state definite d differentiation. Then the platforms fought back on kind of like state compliance with different types of jurisdictions and um, like instituted geo boundaries for various types of compliance and would like, you know, take down Nazi paraphernalia being sold on eBay within France and Germany and leave it up in the US where it's uh, totally allowed under like the first amendment, blah, blah. And so they're just kind of like, those things have continued. Like, and like, it just, those all still happen. Um, but it's just not, um, it's not coming from, it's not coming from a, a user. It's not coming from users like, it's not coming from users, it's coming from like states and like states forcing platforms to, to, uh, to assert different rules. All right, we need to wrap up, but I think we've got a, I, I sent out a bunch of emails inviting people and a few texts and, and, and tweets. Oh my gosh, I didn't even get to show you my lamb. Oh yeah. Show us the lamb, that's the sign off for the day, right? Oh, okay. Lamb prosciutto sign off. Oh yeah. Okay. I'll show you my lamb prosciutto sign off. I was very, I, I don't know. I don't even like lamb. I don't even know if this is going to be that good, but I just was like, this is going, this is like all I've got. So what'd you say? Lamb is the best meat. Do you I really think so? I really do. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I feel about eating it. Cause I like lambs. But yeah, I, I know they're really cute. I know I would feel very guilty too. I yes. feel, I know. I am very good. I have a very good friend who's a cow, but I still eat beef. And so I try, it's like, but I feel, but yes, I feel guilty about it. Yeah, I, I, I feel guilty about it, but lamb is wonderful. So what uh, you got? Let's okay. see. It. Let's see. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, so this is uh, after 14 days and all of the cure washed off. And then uh, I tied it all up. And so this was, this was, this actually took a while. Um, Cause I, I only have nine fingers right now. So this was like actually very difficult <laughs> without like being able to grip, like my grip something. Um, and then I toasted fennel seeds and I rolled the entire thing in fennel seeds. And then if you'll remember, I do not own this house that I'm living in. It is my parents' vacation home. And so I'm sure that they're going to love the fact 
that I have drilled holes in one of their laundry baskets in order to hang um, <laughs> this lamb prosciutto from <laughs> safely so that like things can't get at it. Although I don't, there were our basements very, very clean and unfinished. In our unfinished clean basement and in the corner here is a humidity and temperature thermometer. Um, so I can monitor, uh, but now I just have to wait and hang How out. You have to wait. Um, six to 10 weeks. That used to feel like a long period of time, Ben, but now time has no meaning. And so, <laughs> so uh, let's, let's close on this question because I have a, have a strong feeling about what the answer to it is, but I'm curious about your answer. What, since time has no meaning, but we are humans, so therefore we mark time, what is the thing that distinguishes the days for you? I mean, what's the difference between Tuesday the weather, and The weather. It's like just, it's, incre it's entirely about whether I can go outside or not and like work in my garden and watching my garden grow. So for me, the only thing that distinguishes one day from another, the reason I know it's Tuesday and not Wednesday is which podcasts come out. Oh, really? That's kind yeah. of interesting. Like, like I have certain podcasts that come out every day that I listen to, and that's what distinguishes the day from one another. Otherwise, it's the same physical space. I can't control the weather. You know, it's not like I know it's Wednesday because it's sunny out. Um, but I do know it's Wednesday because Ken White and Josh Barrow's podcast comes out, All the President's Lawyers, right? I know it's uh, Thursday uh, because the Slate Political oh, Gap. Kind of right. I also like, I've been like, I watched Billions and before that I watched Homeland. And so like that was always came out on Sunday. And I was like, what we did on Sunday night. It's kind of similar. Mark marking, time, marking time with broadcast. But in lieu of fun doesn't help you mark the day. No. Because it's every day rain or shine, weekend or weekday, it's, it will help you mark the time though, because it's always at five o'clock. That's when we say, and we're live and give you the Boris Johnson and Kim Jong-un and Murder Hornet news. So we will be back tomorrow with mystery guests. There will be two of them. They may even be sitting together on the couch. And until then, as I'm we very say, curious. Let's, see if, let's see if Kate can get it right today. Uh, in lieu of fun, if you can't have fun, you can ha still hang out with us. <laughs> she, she's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> I didn't get it right. <laughs> mostly right. <laughs>